Michael B. Oren, author of Six Days of War, June 1967, and the making of the modern Middle East. Why do we want to go back and look at that Six Day War in 67? Well, the Six Day War was in many ways the, the pivotal, seminal event for the creation of the modern Middle East. The Middle East that we are witnessing today, the Middle East that is the source of so much tension and controversy and bloodshed. Now, the obvious reason we want to go back is to find out how the West Bank, Gaza, Jerusalem, principally, but also the Golan Heights, came into the possession of the State of Israel, and that happened in June 1967. But the war was also a pivotal event for many other and even more profound reasons. For example, the Six-Day War really spelt a death knell for the movement of Arab nationalism, which was a secular movement in its, in its most sublime form, which was Nasserism under Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt. The, that movement was delegitimized, it was debunked in 1967, and it opened the door to the entry of a new ideology into the Middle East, and that was an Islamic ideology. And that has had profound ramifications for everybody, both in the Middle East and, and here in the United States as well. Um, the Six-Day War also ended the period when the Arab-Israeli conflict was principally a state-to-state -state conflict, a conflict between Israel and Jordan, Israel and Syria, Syria Israel and Egypt. And this, the conflict, a new conflict emerged, a conflict that was principally one between Israel and the Palestinians. Before 67, you really didn't hear about the Palestinians. And it's not by accident that a year after the war ended in 1968, the PLO under Yasser Arafat emerges as this powerful force in the Arab world. And we've been living with that as well. The 67 war was also, also inaugurated the strategic relationship between the United States and Israel. People forget that Israel fought the 67 war not with American arms, but with French weaponry. France was Israel's principal ally. Before that, before 1967, only one Israeli prime minister, one time, for one hour, had visited the White House. <laughs> and it wasn't Israel's founder, David Ben-Gurion. It was, it was, it was Levi Eshkol. One time, June 1964. Today, Ariel Sharon or any Israeli prime minister comes to Washington. It's, it's obvious that he's going to march right into the White House. Um, that began, that very, very close relationship, that cooperation began in the aftermath of 1967, not before that. As you acknowledge, uh, one more book on the Six-Day six War, uh, there have been a lot of them. Yep. What do you have new? What kind of things? Well, do you if you have? look at my bibliography, you'll see about three, four hundred books on the '67 War, and and I always I always encounter that question. Uh, you know, why we need another book on the '67 War? Well, the principal reason is the is the phenomenon of the Thirty Year Rule. I ride the Thirty Year Rule. That is the rule that obtains in most Western style democracies in the United States, in Britain, in Canada, and in Israel which holds that after 30 years, the majority of diplomatic documents that were previously classified as top secret get declassified, and they are become accessible to researchers. And once you have documents, it opens up an entirely new vista into the decision-making process. And that's what this book really is about, is about decision-making. In addition, in, in the last, say, 12 years, um, Soviet documents documents of the former Soviet Union have become available to researchers and the Soviets played a pivotal role uh, in the 67 war, a very crucial role in many ways. They precipitated the crisis uh, and I was able to go to Moscow and to access some of these documents. There's also been a, a new opening in at least two of the three major Arab participants in the war, in Jordan and in Egypt. There's a tremendous wave of publications about the war, memoirs, studies, even the release of certain documents which is very rare in the Arab world, about 1967. The only place that it hasn't occurred in, is in Syria. In Syria, officially the war never occurred. There's not one single official book, and all books in Syria are official, about the 67 war. How the average Syria believes that Israel came into possession of the Golan Heights that formerly belonged to Syria is, is a mystery to me. Let me go through your bio for a moment. Uh, mm -hmm. You were born where? I was born in uh, the tiny town in upstate New York. But I was raised in New Jersey. When did you first go to Israel? I first went when I was 15 years old. I went to work on a kibbutz on a farm. Um, I worked in the alfalfa. I worked in the cows. I became a cowboy. I was a lousy farmer, so I went and studied history. What kind of a Jew was your family, uh, your, your father, your mother? My parents were, we, I grew up in a conservative Jewish community. My parents were uh, very Zionist, very pro-Israel, um, were uh, supportive of the state of Israel, uh, less supportive of my actually moving there. <laughs> it was much a, a shock to them. Uh, were they both from here? 
Both from here, yes, yes. My father had been um, has had been a career army officer for a period uh, in the U.S. Army. Had served in World War II in Korea, and uh, and later on became a hospital administrator. So you say conservative? Is that like the orthodox conservative reform? Right. You be right Correct. in the middle then. Correct. Right in the middle. Right. Uh, and so. Did you fight in the '67 war? No, I was a kid. You were a kid then. Did, you, a kid. did you fight in any war? In I Israel? fought in a couple of them. Yes. <laughs> Which one? Well, I fought in, um, in the Lebanon war. Um, I was quite involved in the Lebanon war. I served in uh, in the Israeli paratroopers at that point. I was in, in Israeli special forces. What year? And this is in 1982, in June 1982. For some reason, wars in the Middle East occur in June, um, almost to the day. Uh, it's probably good war fighting weather. Um, and I was among the, f the first uh, forces to, of Israeli forces to enter the city of Beirut in June 1982. And, and my, my, actu my actual unit um, was decimated in an ambush. Um, and we ended up being attached to all sorts of other units for the duration of the war. Later on, I became one of the few Israelis to be a veteran of the Gulf War. Um, in a period just before the outbreak of the Gulf War, I was assigned as a strategic liaison between the Israeli army and the U.S. Sixth Fleet in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, it's, one of, it's an interesting thing as an historian as well, because in the book, I point out that Israel had re repeatedly requested in 1967 precisely such a liaison with the Sixth Fleet, and the U.S. denied the request. Well, in subsequent years, it, the United States succeeded to the request, and I was the liaison. And it was, first, it was, a, it was a very interesting job. I essentially went out and partied a lot with American pilots who were on leave in Israel. Uh, we had a few maneuvers on the ground, nothing too serious, and all of a sudden, it became real. All of a sudden, there was a real war in which the United States and Israel had to collaborate strategically. And you may recall that uh, the United States provided Israel with Patriot missiles as an answer, at least a psychological answer, because physically they actually didn't work, uh, a psychological answer to the Scud attacks, 41 Scud missiles that fell on Tel Aviv and its environs, and I was part of the team that brought in the Patriot missiles. And they were in Israel, the Patriots. They were in Israel. Yeah. Now, uh, go back to the, your education then. Where did you go to college? I did my undergraduate. I did a, a BA, MA and, in all in Middle Eastern history at Columbia, Columbia College. And then I went on to do an MA and a PhD again in Middle Eastern history at Princeton. You, are you both an Israeli and American citizen? I am. Mm -hmm. And why did you end up in the 82 war in Lebanon? How did that work? Well, I, I'd, um, I'd always wanted to move to Israel. I, I saw my future in Israel. I wanted to raise my family in Israel. And um, in 1973, at the end of the 73 war, which I would have missed had I actually been living in Israel, um, I determined that I wasn't going to move just then. I was going to do my, my BA first. I did my BA, and as it turns out, an MA. I ended up working for the Israeli Foreign Ministry as an advisor to Israel's mission to the UN during a very tumultuous period. It was the period of the Zionism is racism uh, revolt, uh, Arafat's speech before the General Assembly, a very, very tumultuous period. And then I moved to Israel, and I tried out for uh, this, this unit in the Army. The tryouts are rather rigorous, and uh, I did 17 months of basic training and, um, and got out just prior to the Lebanon war. But in Israel, we have uh, you serve uh, for a long period, your regular service, and then you do reserve service to the age of 52. Um, now I have a son in the army uh, who is 19 and uh, in, in a very elite unit. And I am still doing reserve duty. We actually share uniforms. <laughs> very bizarre. How old are you now? I'm 47. And so you can be yeah. called up at any time? I have been, yes. I've, 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 served, I've served in the, in the latest intifada. Um, in a combat role. Where? Uh, in Nablus. Full combat uniform? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be semi-retired. I, I now, um, you stop jumping in the Israeli army and, and paratroopers at age 37, and you, you essentially cease being a combat soldier at age 42. At age 42, 43, I was asked to stay on as an advisor on media relations. So, why not? Sounds interesting. You get good briefings. But when the fighting broke out in the West Bank, um, they asked any of these media advisors if they had combat experience. And like a total fool, I said, oh, of course, I have one. And um, well, we need someone to be attached to the frontline brigade commander uh, who doesn't speak French, doesn't speak English. And CNN and French uh, television is running around there. Someone has to interpret for him. So I was quickly outfitted with a, a new ceramic um, flak jacket and a helmet, and a M16, the whole works, and, uh, and flown out there on a Black Hawk helicopter, which had to do a big sort of detour around Ramallah, because the, the IDF, the Israeli army, was convinced that the Palestinians had shoulder-fired ground-to-air missiles. 
And when we landed, we landed in a hail of gunfire. Uh, I've never seen anything like it since Lebanon. It was it was it was it was intense. Um, and the brigade commander, um, as I landed, got shot in the head. Got a 7.62 Kalashnikov bullet right in the head that was stopped by his newly issued uh, American Kevlar helmet. And Israel hadn't had the new Kevlar helmet. He just got one, and there it was the bullet stuck right in the helmet. Um, and I quickly got myself a Kevlar helmet. <laughs> Have you ever been wounded? Uh, what? Have you ever been wounded? I've been wounded very slightly. Very slightly. Is it, does it ever feel surreal to you? I mean, one day you're at your desk at home doing your work away. Where do you live, by the way? I live in Jerusalem. Well, and the next day you're in a uniform, and then... Always surreal. It, it, the worst part is coming home. The worst part, it always takes a few days to make that switch. Um, you, it, it's bizarre. You get a phone call. Um, you know, this week I'm, I'm celebrating my 20th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. And I got married on August 5th, 1982. As I came home from my wedding and I was unwrapping my gifts, I got a call from the Army saying, listen, in three hours we're going to pick you up in a Jeep outside your house in Jerusalem and we're going to take you to Beirut. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, I just got married. And they said, well, that's not our problem. <laughs> three hours. And I had to don a uniform, get out of my wedding suit, into a uniform. My new wife is crying. My parents, who were there from New Jersey, who hadn't seen me in uniform ever, were in a state of shock. And lo and behold, the Jeep comes by and picks me up. And um, making that transition is, 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 is difficult enough, but coming back from it is even more difficult, because you come back from combat, and everyone's basically going about their business and, and buying shoes and getting on buses and um, and it's very bizarre the last two years however have been a in a category all by themselves Israel lives from crisis to crisis I sometimes I think we're, we're rather addicted to them and um, but this is, the last two years have broken the Israeli paradigm the Israeli paradigm is there's a war it breaks out on the Golan Heights it breaks out in the Sinai you get into uniform you go away you come back in two or three weeks you take a shower you try to forget about it, and you go back to your routine. Over the last two years, however, the war has come to us. And it is no longer out there. The war is in our backyards. And where I live in southern Jerusalem, it's been very, very close to the, f to the front. I mean, a very typical evening with my children around a table, the house will be rocking with gunfire, with, with machine gun fire, with tank fire. Helicopters have come over my house and fired rockets. Uh, and now we've had the suicide bombings. Um, the last major suicide bombing in in, uh, in Jerusalem with the bus bombing uh, blew out the windows of my house. To, so you you live there full time, but you also are associated with an organization called is it the Shalem Shalem Center? Shalem Center is that a full time job? Shalem is a very full time job. Shalem Center is a is a um, young, very dynamic research center that was started uh, about seven years ago um, through the generosity of the, the Zalman Bernstein Foundation. And uh, it, it, it promotes the study of Israel, the study of Middle East, uh, Jewish history, Zionism. Um, it was founded by several young people, graduates of Princeton. Um, and now there are about a hundred people working there. Did I read that Bill Crystal, the Weekly Standard... Uh, He's on our board. ...publisher is on your board. Mm -hmm. Any other Americans that we know? Um, who you would know? Um, um, Leon Cass is on our board. The bioethics right um, uh, associated uh, leader associated with uh, President right. Bush's administration. Um, yes, um, Ronald Lauder, um, New York. Roger Hertog of um, Cap Alliance Capital.